brand new sermon series. We ask a serious question inside the church today, and I think that is, do people really inside the church know what we're talking about? Do we really know about God's holy word? Do we understand it? Do we understand who God is? And somebody came up to you, like Peter said, and asked you, do you know why you believe in God? Would you have an answer? That's hard. It's really hard when people outside the church ask you that question. Why do you believe in God and not somebody else? Why do you believe in the God of Israel and not another God? Why do you stick to God's holy word and not wander? You know, they want an answer. If you tell them, well, my parents believe, or my grandparents believe, or my great-grandparents believe, so I do as well, that usually isn't enough for them. For non-Christian people, they want to know what's in your heart. They want to know what you feel. They want to know that God's holy word is real to you. They want to know that. And the sad part is, when somebody comes up to you and asks you for that testimony, they never give you any warning. It's not like they make an appointment to tell you, oh, by the way, tomorrow, I'm going to come and ask you about God. They just come up out of the blue and say, will you give me a testimony for God? And you've got to be ready. We talked about the first step is knowing that God exists. We said everything that you see outdoors, the entire universe, the complexity of the universe, the fact that nobody really knows how it's all held together, the fact that humanity doesn't understand our own bodies. They're so complex we can't understand them. And the best that science can offer us is there must be someone who created everything. Somebody must have done it. You don't get another answer other than that. We looked at their theories, and all their theories fell down because ultimately they said, who created that first Big Bang? Who created the first piece of material of which all the rest of us were created out of? And they still come back to the same thing. God must have done it. And then we ask even a bigger question. Who can heal hearts? Who can make people well again? Psychologists will tell you some of the things that we get into trouble with as human beings take literally years, if not decades, to heal from. And yet you have time and time again examples inside the church where God will come up and touch somebody and they'll be healed instantly. And the psychologist has no possible reason to give you for that other than that's a miracle. I can't believe that really happened. That's awesome. That's amazing. We're going to talk about God's holy word. Because everything I just talked about is irrelevant unless you believe God's holy word is true. Everything I find out about God, I find from his holy word. I find about Jesus in the holy word. I find out the fact that I get heaven from God's holy word. And if I question it and I say, well, I'm not sure if it's really true, then what can I believe? What can we believe this morning? Somebody's going to ask you in your lifetime. Maybe they have already. But somebody in your lifetime is going to say, why do you pick up God's holy word? Why do you believe it? Why do you believe every word of it? And they're going to give you all sorts of reasons as to why it might be false. And you've got to be ready to stand up and say why God's word is true for you. Why it is the truth regardless of you. Does it really matter what we think about God's word when it comes to truth? The reality is God's word is true regardless of what you think of it. So if a non-Christian comes up and picks up the Bible and says, I think it's not true. That's irrelevant. It's true because God says it is. It's true because of the testimony. It is the truth. We're going to look at that. I remember a story of a pastor friend of mine, and he's got his PhD, and he's a smart fellow. And we would spar every once in a while. And uh, I'd ask him questions. i see if I could trip him up. And most times, well, 90% of the time or better, I never did. And I came up with one question for him, though. And I was surprised that he didn't have an answer. I asked him, I said, you know, as a pastor, and I was just starting to become a pastor, I said, how do I get everybody to get along? Everybody picks up God's holy word, and they get a different interpretation. Everybody's got favorite passages, and passages they don't like to read. Everybody's got pieces of God's holy word that they read, and they say, well, it really means this. They don't want to take a little translation, because that means that convicts them of their sin. They take something completely different, and they run with it. How do I keep them all happy? And as a pastor, they're going to ask me over and over again, what do you think about it? How do I keep them from wanting to lynch me? And he said, look, pastor, you let them believe in anything they want to. As long as it doesn't violate God's holy word in relation to salvation, let them run with it. Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. Don't say anything. And I came back to him. I said, look, if I did that, Everybody in my congregation probably has a different thought and opinion on some portion of Scripture that's contradictory with each other. In doing that, I have to believe in everything. I don't really believe in anything if I do that. Not a single thing, except for God's salvation. I believe far more than that. 
I said, how am I as a pastor supposed to go to a congregation tell them about the Word of God when I'm trying to appease everybody and try to make everybody think that, hey, their version of God's Holy Word is true? Do you realize that 95% of God's Holy Word can be taken literally? I had a professor, a linguistic professor, that made that comment. He said, majority of it can be. There are parables that, yes, you have to interpret. There's the book of Revelation that you certainly, very difficult to take that literally. There's a whole bunch of symbolism in there. But the majority of what we read is literal, and we can take it literally. We just don't want to. We just don't like what we read. And that's why we think up and dream up different ideas. We're going to talk about different things about God's Holy Word. To start out with, it's got to be true. It just has to be. If it's not, our faith is in jeopardy. We're standing on very shaky ground if it's not the truth. And we've got to be ready to tell people why we think that way. Let's look at the composition of the text. These writers, these wonderful writers from all different walks of life, over thousands of years, they've written down every single word that God has dictated to them. You would think that would be enough for us, but it's not. In reality, we ask all sorts of questions about that. We're curious. We want to know, how did that happen in the first place? And how do you know that everything that was written down was true and real? I found this on the internet, and I love this. It shows you a time period in which all the books of the Bible were written. And if you go back to around 3000 BC, you'll notice that right off the bat we've got Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Exodus. We've got the Pentateuch right off the bat. And that was written a long time ago. We're talking approximately 5,000 years ago. And people ask questions like, how do you know that's true? How do you know everything that was written down was true? After all, was it writing back then? I looked up some research on that. That's a little sketchy, but basically around 3000 BC there was writing. It was cuneiform writing. They wrote in clay, of all things. Baked it, dried it, and preserved it. So the question really is, okay, that might handle Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Exodus, but what about Genesis? Moses supposedly wrote the first five books. Well, he wasn't around during the time of Genesis. It's only Adam and Eve. Where did he get the information from? There was no writing. It had to be passed down from word of mouth. Do we rely on that? I started a rumor here this morning, and Dennis mentioned this. If I started a rumor with Dennis this morning and said, everybody take this rumor and you spread it to your neighbor all the way through, by the time it got to the back of the congregation, it wouldn't be the same. It would be completely different. Is that what happened to God's Holy Word? Is that a possibility that that happened? And let's look at the church. Everybody's got their own motivations. Everybody's got different thoughts and ideas. All of us are slightly politically motivated in a certain direction. We know what we do when we read God's Holy Word. We read it the way we want to. We read it the way that it lifts us up, makes us feel special. Is that what happened to these writers? Did they feel that way? Did they have their own agendas? Did they write the things that they thought should be there? Did they leave out other things? These are questions that non-Christian people ask. And guess what? So do Christians. They ask the very same questions. The Old Testament is very hard to prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it was written straight from God without going into Scriptures. But once you walk into Scriptures, that's a different story. We have Jesus. He understood the problem. He understood the issue. He said, do you not think that I've come to abolish all these laws of all the prophets? I ain't come to abolish a thing, he said. Not one jot, not one little tittle, not one stroke of the pen, one, not a single eye inside of God's Bible got there without Jesus saying, yes. Jesus came to tell us that. That was important for us to know that. That all of the Old Testament, he approved. God's only son said, not only is it accurate, but it's my words. I gave it to them. No political agendas. It's mine. That's beautiful. And is Jesus a credible witness? Somebody's going to ask you. Of course in the church, I'd like to think everybody's going to say yes. But people outside the church, not so much so. They're going to ask, well, who is Jesus? And why would you take his word for it? He's lived many years ago. Jesus is a credible witness when you look at it. There's over 300 different references in the Old Testament to Jesus the Messiah. Every single one of those was fulfilled. I like numbers. Because I'm an accountant by trade. And I love numbers. I just enjoy them. And you know what? I did some research on this. And I found out that the probability of just eight, not all 300, just eight of them coming true is one in 100 quadrillion. What's the possibility all 300 of them came true in a man called Jesus? It's impossible it was a miracle. It's impossible. It was a miracle. You know, there's no other written text on the face of the earth that can make this claim. 
Matter of fact, there's very few texts that could say eight different things they predicted came true. Very few you'll find. Only ones that can are the ones that put millions of predictions in them so they might get eight. But not one can make this claim because this was a miracle. Jesus says it is true. Jesus is a credible witness. Let's look at the New Testament. We know the Old Testament is true because Jesus says so and he is a credible witness. But the New Testament is much easier to go through and prove. Around A.D. 27 to 30, Jesus dies and raises again from the dead. By 100 A.D., every single thing we have in the New Testament was written. John was the last disciple to have his stuff written down. He was on the island of Patmos. He wrote down everything God gave for Revelation. Everything was written. Now, we have some documents on that. A few. We have fragments and pieces, but we don't have the original text. We don't have it written right from the author themselves. And here's the reason why. Back then they used paper, but their paper was different than ours. It was from a papery plant, flattened down, and they'd write on it. They wouldn't stay good very long. It would actually fall apart after so many years. Or they wrote a leather, and you'd write that down. But leather fell apart. So every so many years they had to recopy all God's word. Now, you might be saying, if I had to recopy this book, and this is not even God's word, but this book here, let's say, if I had to do that, would I do it accurately? The answer is no, I wouldn't. i make mistakes. I'd miss things. I wouldn't spell things right. Hopefully my spell check would get it, but I would do a very lousy job. Here's some of the stipulations that the Jewish people had to go through when they <coughs> copied God's word. The scroll must be written on the skin of a clean animal. Each skin must have a specified number of columns throughout the entire book. There had to be no more than 48 lines per skin. You'd have to count how many letters going across on the skin, and it would have to be exactly 30 letters. Every consonant within a book would have to be counted, and if it didn't match the original, you threw it out. Wow. 